So I don't have to tell you uh, very much about uh, splicing here, about the, the basics of splicing and alternate splicing. I just will say that there is a renewed interest in alternate splicing for many reasons. It's more a rule than an exception, and it's estimated to affect the expression of nearly 70% of the human genes and mammalian genes, M even more, some people say 80%. It explains how a vast protein diversity can be achieved with a limited number of genes. Uh, as uh, these uh, institutions show in many, many examples, mutations that affect the splicing regulatory sequences that are called enhancers and silencers are a widespread source of human disease. And uh, we know that alternative splicing regulation not only depends on the interaction of splicing factors with their target sequences, but it's coupled to RNA polymerase II transcription, and this is the subject that has uh, called the attention of our lab for the last more than 10 years. So splicing and alternative splicing are coupled with PORC2 transcription, and this is a consequence of splicing being co-transcriptional. And again, uh, as when we found alternative splicing in the fibrinectin gene some 20 something years ago, we thought that that was an interesting case, but probably an exception, and now we know that alternative splicing is a rule. When we started to study splicing as a co-transcription event, we thought that was a certain percentage of splicing that could be co-transcriptional, but now there are many uh, um, genome-wide uh, studies that show that probably co-transcriptionality is the rule, that most, mostly uh, alternative, mostly splicing and alternative splicing are co-transcriptional events. So co-transcriptionality uh, started to be seen as a possibility uh, in the early, uh, in the late 80s, and this is an example of a drosophila gene when you see uh, um, in black, the, the, the drawing represented the, the EM, in black is the DNA, these black dots may be pol 2 uh, molecules uh, transcribing the gene in this direction, the star marks the promoter, and the nascent mRNAs uh, are in, in pink or, or, or uh, I don't know, no, this is purple. And uh, you can see that long before Pol2 molecules reach the end of the gene, we see uh, uh, loops of introns being excised with probably spliceosomes uh, being these dots. So splicing can take place uh, before Pol2 reaches the end of the gene. Uh, so the, the old picture of uh, a, pr a gene primary transcript and then uh, capping, splicing, and polydenylation must be probably replaced by a more dy dynamic situation in which all of the events of the uh, pre-mRNA processing can occur co-transcriptionally, like, for instance, capping, splicing, and cleavage and polydenylation. But co-transcriptionality doesn't necessarily mean coupling, and this was very well explained in a, in a paper by Lazarev and Manley in RNA in 2007, in which they, they show that it could be three different uh, situations. One is a parallel reaction, where splicing is clearly post-transcriptional. A concurrent reaction, where splicing is taking place before Pol2 reaches the end of the gene and a coupled reaction. Coupled reaction means that either the recruitment or kinetics of transcription are affecting the rate or the outcome of splicing and also vice versa. The recruitment or uh, a kinetic of splicing can affect Pol2 transcription. So the idea of coupling came from experiments done in my lab by Paula Kramer some, some uh, years ago in which we decided to see what happened if we changed the promoter to different mini genes that uh, were reported mini genes for uh, these uh, alternate splicing of this cassette exon that we call ED1 or EDA. And uh, here we show only three different promoters, but we, we changed uh, the mini genes with, diff with about you know, 10 different promoters. And these are uh, paradigmatic cases of the alpha globin fibrinectin or cytomegalovirus promoters, and we transfect cells with these mini genes and then assess alternative splicing by RT-PCR. And what we observed at that time is that if transcription was driven by the alpha globin promoter, there was little inclusion of the alternative, ex alternative exon. But if transcription was driven by the fibronectin or the CMB promoter, there were higher inclusion <coughs> levels, and this was not 
correlated with the mRNA expression levels because, for instance, alpha globin and fibronectin were highly expressing mRNA, while CMB was a lower expressor of mRNA. But uh, these two having similar expression levels have different inclusion levels, and these two having different expression levels have similar um, inclusion levels, which means that probably that was uh, related not to the um, strength of the promoter, but to the quality of the promoter conferred to the transcription apparatus or transcription machinery. So the modes of coupling uh, at that time we thought could be two different kinds of uh, mechanisms. One is that the promoter or the coupling was affecting uh, the rate of pole 2 elongation, what we call kinetic coupling. And the other one is that it was affecting the recruitment of processing factors on RNA polymerase 2, in particular on the carboxy terminal domain. And we call that recruitment coupling. So the um, pole 2 elongation uh, mechanism was based in, 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 a me in, a, in a model that was known before of the first come, first served, in which if pole 2 was running fast with no pauses, then when there are two competing splicing sites, a weak site or a strong site, the stronger site, hola, <laughs> could uh, uh, be used uh, and outcompete the weaker side, and uh, the spliceosome would lead uh, away out uh, the um, intron, con the exon, the, ex the alternative exon. This would lead to exclusion. But if pole two was slower, then the weak side could be uh, synthesized first, and the stronger side that would lead g give time to the organization of to the recruitment of the spliceosome. Then the first intron <coughs> could be excised first and the second intron could be excised second, which would give to inclusion. Actually, this kind of model doesn't take into account a concept that is uh, the exon definition, because it, suppose, it, it, it assumes that the first intron can be spliced without having seen the splicing machinery, the donor of the second intron. And actually, uh, as we, I will show now, just very preliminary experiments, we, we, we have to revisit this model because we have uh, evidence that in fact what happens is that the first come first served uh, in our system, first serve doesn't mean first excise, but first serve means first committed. And, and we, will, we have uh, evidence now that the fact is that if poll 2 goes uh, slower, it, it's not that it gives time to the excision of the first intron first, but it gives time to the recruitment of factors that commit to splice in the first intron, and then when the poll 2 proceeds, uh, we have commitment of the second intron, and then in a, in a model that respects the exon definition, we have more inclusion. So the evidence for that, and I will not have time to, to, tol to tell you all the experiments, is that we can have two different intermediates in the splicing uh, mechanisms that lead to inclusion. One in which the first intron is excised first, and the second one in the second intron is excised first. So we wonder which of the two uh, mechanism was taking place. And actually, we found that this way is much more abundant than this way. And we have uh, evidence that, uh, in fact, what happens is that there is no first excision but first recruitment, and the second intron is excised first, leading to inclusion. Uh, the role of pole 2 elongation was confirmed by the use of a slow polymerase 2 mutant. And this is just showing one of the results. Uh, we have plenty of evidence that uh, there was a control of elongation on the inclusion of the alternative cassette exon. But the, the, the more direct way to demonstrate this was uh, done by Manuel de la Mata in my lab, and, and, and we published this some years ago, in which we use a mutant that was originally described in Drosophila, that is a single amino acid change in the large subunit of RNA polymerase 2. And this mutant changes uh, arginine for a histidine, and is known to be uh, slower than the wild type. So uh, to uh, express this mutant, we used uh, a system developed by Jeffrey Corden in, in um, Johns Hopkins, 
in which we transfect the cells with the reporter mini gene and also with plasmid expressing the wild type or the slow RNA polymerase II, but both of them having a second mutation that makes them resistant to alpha manitin. So when we treat the cells with alpha manitin, we uh, inhibit transcription by the endogen of POL2, and we allow the mini gene to be transcribed by the recombinant POL2 that could be either wild type or slow. And uh, essentially, you can see here that if we assess alternative splicing of the reported mini gene, when transcription is uh, driven by the wild type polymerase, we have a certain level of exon inclusion, but when transcription is driven by the slow polymerase, exon inclusion goes up by four times, which confirmed in a way that the rate of transcription, the rate of elongation was important for the fate of alternative splicing. So what can change POL2 elongation rate uh, in a more physiological situation or in a more controlled way? Because we were using a slow POL2 mutant that it doesn't exist in humans, and it was a good tool to demonstrate the model, but not no, doesn't, I mean, we don't have patients with slow pole 2 although we want to make mice with slow pole 2 now, but we, we don't have them uh, naturally occurring. So essentially, and, and up till now, there was sort of introduction of, of, of two um, lines of uh, my lab that were developed in the last two years or three years. Uh, the changes in pole 2 elongation rate, the kinetic coupling, could be uh, um, achieved by modulation of POL2 intrinsic activity, for instance, mm, CTD phosphorylation or association to elongation factors, or by changes in the template chromatin structure that limit or facilitate elongation. So you can see that, that the track can go faster or slower because uh, of how much you, you fuel it, or the track can go slower or faster depending on, 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 on the road, whether the road is bumpy or not. And chromatin is the road for pole 2. So let's first see what happens in modulation of pole 2 intrinsic activity. And, and, and in this case, and this refers to the, to the paper that Mauro mentioned in the introduction, we studied the effects of UV light and DNA damage on alternative splicing. And we found that if you uh, UV irradiate the cells with low doses of UV, this is about uh, between 20 uh, and 40 joules per square meter, this is a few seconds of irradiating the cells and uh, analyzing the effects uh, many hours later, or even one day later, we observed that both in endogenous genes and in transfecting mini genes, uh, alternative splicing changed. For instance, in the case of the fibronectin ED1 or ED8 exon, we had a 2.5 increase of the endogenous uh, levels of inclusion. But also, we have changes in, in, in alternative splicing of genes that were important for the um, apoptotic pathway. For instance, in the case of BCLX, we have changes that uh, promoted a, a higher ratio of the pro-apoptotic isoforms. And in the case of the Chi-Space 9 gene, also we have changes that promoted the higher, higher inclusion of the pro-apoptotic isoform. Which makes sense, because if you radiate the cells, you create mutations. And, and one of the responses to uh, the, mutated, the mutating uh, activity of UV light or DNA damage is to promote cell death. To, to avoid spreading of the mutation. So it, it sounds to us uh, very reasonable that we had changes in alternative splicing of uh, genes which were involved in the apoptotic cascade. But we wanted to see what, what was the mechanism. And one of the first experiments we did to, to rule out uh, DNA damage in cis was to transfect cells with a mini gene and see what happens if we irradiate the cells after transfection or before transfection. And in both cases, we have the similar result of alternative splicing, meaning that if we have a ratio of one here, then the ratio would become eight, eightfold higher if we radiate the cells after transfection of the reported mini gene or before transfection, which means that the UV effect is not due to the damage of DNA template in cis, is due to DNA damage, probably, to DNA damage of the nuclear DNA, but there was some systemic effect, some change in the metabolism of the cells that affected the alternative splicing of our reported mini gene, but that didn't have to be damaged itself. Uh, 
So the other question was uh, whether the effect of UV light of altern on alternative splicing uh, needed co-transcriptional splicing or could be seen in post-transcriptional splicing. So to see this, we compare the effect of UV light of many genes transfected into cells, which we already saw there was an increase in exon inclusion, or instead transfecting the cells with pre-mRNA, with RNA made in vitro that was capped and polyadenylated in vitro, and uh, see what happened with alternative splicing of, the, of this template. This template is exactly the same sequence as the template that was generated by the DNA when we transfect DNA, mini genes. And you can see here that the, all, while when we <coughs> use the DNA as template, we see an effect on alternative splicing. When we use the pre-mRNA to transfect, we do see alternative splicing, but we don't see any effect of UV light. And these are controls that if you would degrade the RNA before with RNAs, you don't see anything. And if you transfect with a pre-mRNA that has a mutation that increases the inclusion of the alternative exon, we manage to see higher inclusion levels, which means that it's not the method that prevents uh, to see higher inclusion levels, but it's the absence of effect of UV light on the already pre-made pre-mRNA. So this, this indicated us that the effect is co-transcriptional. <coughs> so I don't have time to tell you all the experiments we did to rule out different pathways, but the main pathway of DNA damage involves uh, these kinases, ATR uh, and, uh, and ATM, that phosphorylate the transcription factor P53, and we ruled out this way. I mean, P53 is not involved, ATR is not involved. Uh, I, I don't have time to show you, but also DNA damage affects 3' and processing by uh, stabilizing a BRCA1 bar 1 complex that sequester one of, sequesters one of the uh, 3' and processing factors, that is CSTF50, but we rule out that, that pathway. We also rule, rule out that that was a consequence of Pol2 degradation, that it was known to be uh, promoted by UV uh, DNA damage. And we ruled out ERK, and finally, we were left to the uh, hyperphosphorylation of RNA polymerase II. And it was known that DNA damage caused the uh, dissociation of this complex called hexim from a factor called PTFB, and PTFB is a factor that phosphorylates Pol2 at the, at the carboxytamyl domain on the CTD on serine uh, 2. But we will see now more about what is the consequence of Pol2 hyperphosphorylation. So RNA polymerase 2 has 12 subunits, and the larger subunits, that is uh, our subunit number 1, has this uh, particular carboxytamylal domain, or CTD. <laughs> so the CTD is a tail, it's a flexible tail, and the fact is that the dogma says CTD is made of 52 repeats uh, of seven amino acids, uh, and they ha have uh, th three serines, and these two serines, serine two and serine five, are uh, phosphorylated by different kinases and regulate the cycle of Pol2 transcription. And it was known that uh, serine five phosphorylation by the factor TF2H was associated to initiation of transcription, while serine two phosphorylation by PTFB is associated to Pol2 elongation. And, and uh, serine 2 phosphorylation can be inhibited by DRB, that is a nucleotide analog of uh, flavopyridol. So this was the, 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 the dogma and the paradigm, and we wanted to see whether in our case UV light was affecting Pol2 phosphorylation at serine 2 or serine 5. We, we, we knew from the literature that serine 2 was affected, but we wanted to see what happened in our case. So. Uh, to our surprise, this is a Western blot of the two forms of Pol2. This is Pol2 hyperphosphorylated and Pol2 hypophosphorylated. And you can see that uh, when you uh, irradiate the cells, there is a hyperphosphorylation. Uh, this, is, this changes from here to here. And this hyperphosphorylation can be completely prevented by treating the cells simultaneously with DRB. And DRB also inhibits the basal 
pole 2 phosphorylation. So this was OK. I mean, uh, it seemed to be that the phosphorylation caused by UV light was uh, um, performed by PTFB and affected mostly serine 2. So together with David Bentley in Denver, we uh, decided to see what happened if we created phosphomimetic mutants of the CTV. And, and there were, they, they gave us two different mutants, one in which all the series two were uh, replaced by, uh, no, this is serine five, I think. Serine five were replaced by glutamic acid, and another one in which all the series two were replaced by glutamic acid. And we went to see what happened if we transcribed our, our uh, mini gene with these mutants using the same kind of approach we use for the slow polymerase, which means these mutants are also alpha amanitin resistant. If we transfect the cells and we uh, treat the cells with alpha amanitin, the endogenous fold 2 will be killed, and we will only see what happens with transcription when these mutants are used. And what we saw is in, the terms of, in terms of alternative splicing, looking at inclusion, that both the serin 2 and the serin 5 replacements have similar effects. Both of them uh, increased the inclusion levels of the alternative exon in the absence of UV light. So we were, in a way, mimicking the effects of UV light by replacing either serin 2 or serin 5 by glutamic acid. OK, so the, the, the uh, reciprocal experiment would be that if we replace these serins by alanines, then they cannot be phosphorylated, then they should be resistant to UV radiation in terms of affecting alternate splicing. And this is what we did. We used a mutant in which both serins were replaced by alanines. This is a non-phosphorylatable mutant. And when we transfect the cells with this uh, pol 2 mutant and look at the splicing in the same system with alpha manitin, what we see is that the wild type polymerase allows for the effect of UV light on alternative splicing, but the non phosphorylated, the, the, the one that cannot be phosphorylated, uh, does, I mean, you see alternative splicing, but there is no effect of UV light, which now pointed out to the fact that hyperphosphorylation caused by UV light was the cause of the change in alternative splicing, and that you need uh, phosphorylation probably of both. Uh, serine, serine 2, and serine 5 to see the effect. So to see that this was affecting elongation, we had to measure pol 2 elongation. And, and for that, we collaborated with Edouard Bertrand in Montpellier. And we measured pol 2 elongation rates in vivo and in real time by FRAP, but fluorescent recovery after photobleaching. And, and this is a system that uses a stable cell lines in which you have <coughs> Uh, inserted uh, a reporter, this is not a fibronectin reporter, this is an HIV reporter, it's a complex <laughs> reporter, which has this viral MS, this phage MS2 sites, and when this reporter is transcribed, the RNA uh, contains these uh, uh, stemman loops from the MS2 sites, and these stemman loops are the binding sites for the MS2 protein. And this MS2 is uh, fused to GFP, uh, the, MS, the fluorescent protein binds to the nascent RNA. And the key uh, feature of this binding is it's a very, very, very stable binding. This is a binding that has a, a K of very, very low, which means that uh, it's practically irreversible. So what they do is look at the uh, site where the reporter is integrated, and since there is MS2 GFP all around the, nu the nucleus, but it's only concentrated in the place where the RNA is being made, you see a transcription focus. And uh, the FRAP technique means to uh, identify that transcription focus and to bleach it with a laser beam. And if you bleach that focus with a laser beam, then fluorescence disappears, of course. But since the nucleus is plenty of MS2 GFP in a diffuse form, then if new messengers start to be uh, made, 
then we see a recovery of the, of the fluorescence, not because of an exchange between the already existing binding, because as I told you, this is a very low K off, this is a very irreversible binding, but just because new messaging is being made. So along, if new messaging is being made, then we recover the fluorescence of the transcription focus. So uh, in Edouard uh, Bertrand's lab, they analyze hundreds of nuclei one by one, and then uh, measure the recovery of photobleaching in different situations. One situation is what happened with UV radiation. So you have to consider these curves like the fluorescence intensity before and after bleaching, before is one, after bleaching is zero, <coughs> and then the time taken to recover the fluorescence. And you can see here that in the recovery curves for the untreated cells are in green, and then for the cells that were irradiated, one hour after irradiation, we don't see any change in the, in the kinetic of recoveries, but two hours after irradiation, in which we know that the levels of POL2 hyperphosphorylation are very high, uh, we see a reduction in POL2 uh, recovery, the FRAP recovery, which is consistent with the reduction in POL2 elongation. And this is similar to the curve we observed in the same experiment when we use the slow polymerase mutant. If we use the slow polymerase mutant, again, we get, we get from one to zero, and this is a recovery with a wild type pole two, and this is a recovery with a slow pole two, which is almost uh, twice or two-fold slower. And this, is what the, this was the first time in which we could uh, check that our slow pole two uh, um, was slow in vivo because we used it to change the splicing, but we didn't have any evidence that it was really slow in vivo and in real time. But again, what happened with the other mutants, but you can see that uh, both the green curve is a recovery of the wild type all 2 and these are the two phosphomimetic mutants, the one that has glutamic acid in position 5 and the one that has glutamic acid in position 2. Any of the two that have the similar effect on adenosine splicing have slower elongation in vivo. So we have a connection now between DNA damage, hyperphosphorylation, reduction in pol 2 elongation, and change in alternative splicing according to the first camp for served that doesn't mean that first uh, the first excise that could be first recruited. <coughs> so the, the model is that the change in uh, Kinetics in this case is caused by UV and hyperphosphorylation of POL2. So, how global are the effects of UV light on alternative splicing? Well, um, w together with uh, Maria Paola Paronetto in, in Juan Valcarson's lab, we uh, did some splicing microarrays, splicing sensitive microarrays, and uh, essentially we looked at about 500 alternate, no, 500 genes, 1400 alternate splicing events of cells that were treated or not with UV radiation. And essentially you can see that not all alternative splicing events are affected by UV light. We guess that the pol 2 elongation is systemic. The change in elongation affects the whole, the whole system, but not all alternative splicing events are sensitive to changes in elongation. So what we see is that, for instance, in uh, blue and light blue, you see genes with no changes in expression. In uh, red and pink, genes with changes in expression. This, this is about 14% of the genes we analyze change in expression. And uh, in uh, pink and light blue genes, we change in alternative splicing. About 21% of the genes we analyze have changes in alternative splicing upon UV radiation. But the most interesting thing is that the percentage of genes that change alternative splicing are much higher among the genes that change in expression than among the genes that do not change in expression, which also points at that the changes in alternative splicing are probably related to changes in transcription, as we saw when we reduce elongation, we see changes in splicing. So now the second and last part of my talk will deal with 
what happens with changes in the template chromatin structure that can limit or facilitate elongation. And uh, this is something that is uh, linking chromatin and splicing, chromatin and alternate splicing. And the idea that it was possible came from uh, work done by Sebastian Cather in my lab in, in, in 2001, in which we knew that if we transfect cells with the plasmid and we allow that plasmid to replicate, uh, there is a more compact nucleosome assembly on the transiently transfected plasmid. And that more compact nucleosome assembly was accompanied by a change in splicing of the reporter. If this plasmid is a reporter minigene. Let me show you. This is, a, this is for instance, the ratio of uh, inclusion for a plasmid reporter minigene that hasn't been uh, allowed to replicate. And this is the ratio of inclusion of the same plasmid that has been allowed to replicate. And we interpreted at that time that, that there was a re reduction in pol 2 elongation. And we could, could demonstrate that that was due to replication, because to replicate, you need the origin of replication of SV40 being present in the plasmid, but also the expression of SV40 T antigen in the cells. So if we either deleted the origin of replication or avoid the expression or prevent the expression of T antigen, we didn't see this result. So it was a cause, was a consequence of replication. But at that time, uh, we just thought that an open chromatin status could allow for higher elongation and a more compact chromatin status would allow for slower elongation. Uh, but at that time, I, 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 as you are aware, we didn't know, know nothing about histone codes or epigenetics. And uh, you know now there are specific modifications, specific covalent modifications to the histones that are associated to heterochromatin formation. I, this is to gene silencing or to more open chromatin uh, structures that are uh, associated to more higher gene expression. So for instance, methylation of lysine 9 of histone 3 uh, is associated to uh, more heterochromatin formation. And this is also the case for methylation of lysine 27 of histone 3. But on the contrary, acetylation of lysine 9 of histone 3 is more associated to higher gene expression. And these are mutually exclusive, OK? The same lysine 9 cannot be methylated or acetylated. So the question Mariano Alio uh, um, wonder in my lab is, can we create these chromatin marks in the gene body in a specific a control way? If we could create a heterochromatin region in a gene, maybe we, could, we can slow that elongation and affect splicing. But it depends where we create that heter heterochromatin region, we would affect splicing or not. So to try to create these marks, we uh, went to non-classical or genomic effects of transfecting siRNAs. And the classical post-transcriptional gene silencing that everybody uses to knock down expression of proteins uh, is a cytoplasmic event in which if you transfect cells with siRNAs, uh, one of the two strands of the double-stranded RNA enter a silence, enters a silencing <coughs> complex, it's called RISC, containing many proteins, among them AGO1 in mammalian cells. And this uh, RNA then base pairs with a target mRNA and promotes degradation. It's degradation. This is then called post-transcriptional gene silencing that in fact involves mRNA degradation in a sequence-specific way. But there is another mechanism that is less uh, universally known, but there, are, there is lots of papers, recent papers, that uh, um, evidence the existence of me these mechanisms in, in mammalian cells in which a nuclear event involves the same double-stranded siRNA, but another complex, a complex that probably is related to RITS, we don't know exactly, but contains the AGO1 uh, protein in mammalian cells. And for instance, if the sequence of the siRNA targets a promoter, promoter region, you know that there is transcription outside Covid regions, that is transcription, intergenic transcription, and also promoter transcription at very low levels, but there is, there is enough to have uh, spurious RNAs everywhere. Uh, then the, there is a base pairing between the RNA uh, 
targeted, targeting the promoter, and this promotes a recruitment of uh, chromatin-modifying enzymes, in this case, uh, methylating, enzyme, methylating enzymes that methylate histone, 3, histone H3, and this creates a heterochromatin localized region of the promoter that inhibits transcription. That's why this is called transcriptional gene silence in TGS. So in both cases, in the PTGS or in the TGS, we have silencing. But in the PTGS, silencing is by degradation of the final mRNA product, while in TGS, silencing is caused by a chromatin modification that inhibits transcription. So Mariano wonder what happens if we transfect cells with the cyanase that instead of targeting promoters, target intronic sequences downstream of an alternative exon. So to that, we had to uh, be sure that we, we, we did the right controls to make sure which of the two strands of the double strand of the cyanase <coughs> would enter the, sil the silencing complex. And we followed two different strategies. One is following the asymmetry rules in which changing the delta G of the ends of the double-stranded siRNA, you can uh, mm, <coughs> stimulate the entry into the silencing complex either of the sense strand or the anti-sense strand. So uh, it is known that the um, strand in which the uh, five prime end is the, um, has a lower delta G, is uh, that strand, let me see exactly, this is the sense, this is the anti-sense, this is the lower delta G. So the lower delta G at the five prime end is the strand that enters the silencing complex. But I, I'll tell you the, the long story short, and I, I'll tell you the end of the story, because when we sent this paper to publish, uh, one of the reviewers said, okay, this is one of the rules. We want another, another evidence that you are using the sense or the anti-sense in your experiments. So we had to find a different kind of, uh, of uh, chemistry, and we went to Invitrogen that they make these stealth oligos. The stealth oligos are uh, uh, chemically modified oligos, RNA oligos, in which they guarantee that either the sense or the anti-sense strand uh, enter the silencing complex. But the problem is that they don't tell you what, what is the chemical modification. And the reviewer wanted to know what is the chemical <laughs> modification. So we were in the middle of a quarrel between uh, Invitrogen, that had proprietary uh, rights on, on their chemical modifications, the reviewer who insisted that wanted to see what was the chemical modification, and of course the editor, who has the power. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I told Tito, I mean, editors are the ones that decide what they want to. <laughs> so the editor said, well, can you ask them? Yes, I asked them. We, we, they said, well, why don't you talk to, to, to Invitrogen? And, and, well, finally, they allowed not to give us the chemical modification, but to give us experiments, a different kind of experiments done in the company that show <coughs> that uh, the strand strand uh, shut down <coughs> certain processes on the anti sense strand, uh, the sense strand. Well, so we, we, we don't know the, the, what the chemical. And the, the, the argument was <coughs> but you buy lipofectamine from us, and you never ask what lipofectamine is. Well, it's a lipid, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah, but why the reviewer doesn't ask you what is the lipid you are using for transfecting? So we don't tell people what lipofectamine is, so we, don't tell, we will not tell you what stealth is. But they work as a sense or anti-sense. So why all this story? Because so Mariano prepared or ordered oligos with the anti- when, when I say sense or anti-sense, you understand that this is a double strand always in which the sense preferentially enters the silencing complex or not. So this is the endogenous fibrinating gene, OK? And, and these regions, A, B, C, and D, are for, for later experiments. But now the endogenous genes, uh, ED1 in my lab, or EDA in Tito's lab, is uh, exon 34. OK? It's exon 34, isn't it? Oh, 33, 33, 33. So we can call it exon 33, OK? That's the reason why they have different names. No, no, but why? Because the, we call the, the oligos according to uh, intron 
names. So intron 33AS is an oligo that targets intron 33 and is an antisense. Intron 33S is the same oligo but targeting with, with a modification that makes, makes it enter as a sense strand. So essentially, and these are controls, intron 32, 32 antisense, 34 antisense, and we, we did many others. But you can see that if you transfect cells with SI look, with a control, Lucifer is uh, siRNA, there is no change in splicing, no change in alternative splicing. This one doesn't change alternative splicing. And here you see that the intron 33 in an anti-sense configuration uh, increases exon inclusion. But the same oligo in a sense configuration doesn't change splicing. And this one, intron 34 in a sense, doesn't change splicing. So, OK, this was a start. We thought maybe this is creating something here and has to uh, base pair to hybridize with the nascent RNA at the intronic region. Okay? That's why the anti-sense works and the sense doesn't work. Because we, we, have, we have an effect that probably requires uh, hybridization between our uh, small interferon RNA and the nascent fibronectin RNA. So to see whether this was related to a change in chromatin structure, we tried to see what happened if we use reagents that were known to open chromatin with different mechanisms of action. <coughs> so we use uh, tricostatin A that inhibits histamine di diacetylases. We use uh, 5 asa dc that inhibits DNA methylation. And we use this compound from Beringer that is BIX01294 that inhibits histone 3 lysine 9 dimethylation. And all three compounds reduce or abolish the effect of intron 33 AS when we transfect the cells with this siRNA. This is the control. You see the change in splicing, but this change is either slower or abolished with TSA, 5 asa DC, and BIX. In the case of BIX, also there was a company involved because Beringer uh, doesn't sell this product, but we, we ask them to give them the product and they say, okay, when you have the manuscript, send us a manuscript and if we are interested, we talk. If we are not interested, uh, you publish it. And they were not interested and we publish it, okay. <laughs> but they, they don't charge us anything. And the formula is known. Huh? Yeah, this man had a lot of trouble. So do intronic SIRNAs create silence in chromatin marks? And the answer is yes. For this, we did uh, chip chromatin immunoprecipitation with antibodies against uh, H3K9 dimethylation or H3K27 trimethylation. Both of them are heterochromatin marks. And we use N-chip, which is a, var a variation of the classical chromatin immunoprecipitation. In this case, we don't cross-link proteins to the DNA. We uh, just isolate nucleosomes and immunoprecipitate nucleosomes. That's what is N from, from native G. You don't, you don't have cross-linking here. But the regions I showed you before, A, B, C, and D, are to see what happens with the chromatin structure with the chip with these two marks uh, when we transfect cells with this uh, intronic, uh, with this, um, sorry, siRNA sequence. And, and you can see that uh, we don't see uh, changes in uh, K9 dimethylation at the promoter region, at, at the exon 1, but we do see changes at the target region, region B, and also some changes downstream, C, and they fade away in D. And in the case of uh, lysine 27 trimethylation, we knew and uh, we confirmed that the levels of uh, K27 trimethylation are higher at the promoter, but these levels do not change upon transfection of the cells with a small RNA, and they do change uh, in the regions where they are lower B, C, and D. B, C, and D. Again here, the, the, the change in chromatin seems to extend downstream of the target site, but now we see that the D region, we, don't, we didn't see with the uh, K9 dimethylation at the D region. So we were happy that, to see that there was a change in chromatin in the region we, um, we were um, 
messing around with the CRNA. Let me tell you something that I didn't tell you, and that was a suggestion that Tito did in one of the meetings we, we met some years ago, and there was a poster on, on this, and Tito asked whether the SIRNA targeting the intron promoted degradation of the pre-mRNA. Remember that? And we did the experiment, and it doesn't degrade the pre-mRNA. So the sRNA targeting an intron doesn't affect neither the levels nor the, 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 the structure doesn't cut it in the middle, doesn't promote any degradation of the pre-mRNA. Uh, all different is if you target an exon. If you target an, an exon, since the exon is present in the mature mRNA, that will be degraded, and you will see that now. So uh, the other controls with it is that, as I told you, uh, AGO1 uh, seems to be one of the argonaut proteins that are sp is specific for TGS, while AGO2 is both necessary for TGS and PTGS. And we knock down AGO1 and AGO2, and knocking down any of them abolishes the effect of intron 33 as on uh, alternative splicing, which probably means that uh, um, it's also TGS involved. So as I uh, mentioned uh, just now, what happens if we target exonic sequences? So if we target exonic sequences, we m will promote the graduation of the messenger, because this is a classical PTGS. That's what everybody does every day, the transfecting cells to knock down expression. But then. We uh, targeted two exons, exon 21 and exon 34. The difference is exon 21 is while upstream of the cassette exon that is alternative splice, and exon 34 is very near the target site of intron 33 AS that was the, 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 the oligo that was promoting our effect. So you can see, let's go first to the mRNA levels. Uh, obviously, both siRNAs promote 90% or 80% degradation of the mRNAs, okay? But what happens in the remaining mRNA? We can see the proportions of uh, exon inclusion in, 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 the, in, in the remaining mRNA that is not degraded. And you can see that when we transfected with exon 21, there was no change in alternative splicing, but when we transfected with exon 34 antisense, we saw, we saw the same change in alternative splicing that we saw with the intronic sequence. So we are having here a double effect. On one hand, PTGS, we are degrading the cytoplasm, the, the, end, the end products, but those end products before, being, before reaching the cytoplasm probably suffered some change in alternative <coughs> splicing caused by the particular position of this siRNA targeting a region that is downstream in the gene of the alternative exon. So uh, the last, uh, very last part is uh, that we had some sense strand effects. And the thing is, when Mariano did the experiments just because of, of I mean, everybody wants to know how tissue specific is something, so we say, well, transfect another cell line and see what happens. And when he transfected HeLa cells, we were working on HEP3B cells, cells that we started to work in Oxford many, many years ago, and we, we still continue. They are very friendly to us, or at least we are used to them. I don't know whether they are friendly. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens? This is the results on HEP3B cells, okay, that I showed you before. Uh, as I look, intron 33 AS, changing alternative splicing, but the sense strand doesn't have any effect. But in HeLa cells, both strands have the similar effect. So when you have this, you have two options, or dismiss it, or say, well, it's just, you don't know, or try to investigate it. And Mariano uh, investigated, first of all, in the databases bioinformatically, and uh, why is so? And he found an EST, it means an process RNA that is an antisense EST of the fibronectin gene. And this antisense that has this number there uh, spans, I mean, this is the EST, but if you map the EST to the gene, of course, you end up having exons 
and introns in the antisense strand. And these exons that have nothing to do with the fibronectin exons, and they don't coincide, of course, with the fibronectin exons. <coughs> but this EXT, EST exists. Uh, and so this could be, this RNA could be the target of the sense strand of the small RNA that explain why in HeLa cells we have similar effects with the sense strand. But if true, then there should be a difference in the expression of this EST or this mRNA in HeLa cells compared to HEP3B cells. And you can see here the RT-PCRs that are not bioinformatics. These are real results. And you see, well, bioinformatics <laughs> are also real results, but you want to see them on the, on the bench too. Uh, huh? <laughs> RT-PCR is more real for me, sorry. <laughs> so, but you can see that in HEP3B cells, this is the product of the RT-PCR of the sense uh, fibronectin messenger. And you don't see very much of the shorter product with the same pair of primers because it doesn't matter when you do you know cDNA it doesn't matter if you use one or the other primer but look in, look at look, look in Hila Hila expresses much less of the sense transcript but almost similar or at least much more abundant compared of the antisense <laughs> so this this was nice because indicated that an antisense transcript in Hila cells could be the target of the sense small RNAs, and that's why we saw an effect on chromatin and alternate splicing. So this is a model I will not just show you. Uh, the, the big question is whether there is an endogenous TGS, what well, we call this TGSAS, for transcriptional gene silencing, control, alternate splicing. So the, the big question is whether there is an endogenous TGS alternate splicing uh, pathway because we were using, again, siRNAs um, made in vitro. And th the first approach to, to try to solve this, although we, we are still working on, on um, AGO1 chips genome-wide to see what are the targets of AGO1 in the genome and to see if we find something near an alternative exon and study the endogenous pathway. But the first uh, approach was, instead of using um, Splicing sensitive <coughs> microarrays. Uh, in this opportunity, we used uh, a panel of 96 alternative splicing events. And we asked this panel, we investigated this panel with uh, mRNA from cells in which either AGO1 or DICER were knocked down. The rationale was that if AGO1 is involved in TGS, we would, see, we would have a hint of which events of alternative splicing are affected by this mm -hmm. pathway. And the knockdown of DICER was because if there was an endogenous small double-stranded uh, RNA, probably it was generated by DICER, but this is just speculation. Whatever, we saw that there is an important proportion of, of genes in, that are affected by knocking down AGO1, uh, knocking down DICER alone, but there is an overlap in genes that affect, are affected by alternative splicing when you knock down both of them. So this is, was just uh, indicative that maybe endogenous pathways that involve smaller RNAs and uh, TGS uh, can affect alternative splicing but needs much more investigation. So other examples of intragenic chromatin changes that affect alternative splicing through elongation I didn't show you, but we showed that when we transfect the cells with this iRNA, there is a reduction in, not in elongation, we didn't measure it in vivo in real time like with the FRAP because that is almost impossible. We had to create a cell line especially for that. But we showed that there is an accumulation of proximal over distal messenger RNAs which was consistent with the reduction in elongation. And other examples of intragenic chromatin changes, uh, one of them comes from my lab in which uh, Ignacio Shore has shown this year that in the case of the NCAM exon 18 alternate splicing, neuronal, de neuronal depolarization uh, induces intragenic acetylation and this acetylation opens the chromatin makes Paul Took to go faster and allows this exon to be excluded or more excluded from the mature messenger. And this has physiological implications because uh, this is consistent exclusion of 
NCAM exon uh, 18 is consistent with neurons that are more able to establish new connections that are more similar to young neurons compared to very uh, established and differentiated neurons. Another case some years ago comes from uh, uh, the um, Muchard lab in, 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 at the Pasteur Institute in Paris where Eric Bachet uh, showed that the chromatin remodeling factor swi sniff is able to promote heterochromatin formation in the middle of the CD44 gene. And this uh, heterochromatin formation was associated to a reduction in pol 2 elongation and to an increase in the inclusion of alternative splicing exons into the mature messenger RNA. But the link between chromatin and splicing is also suggested by genome-wide data. And maybe you, you all are aware uh, that there are recent papers showing that there is a connection between the chromatin code and the splicing code. And this was suggested some years ago by the observation that the average size of exons is similar to the average size of the string, DNA string that wraps one nucleosome, about 150 base pairs. Of course, there are exons of 90 base pairs and exons of 300 base pairs, but the average is around 140. And uh, uh, two labs, uh, Roderick Guigot in uh, Barcelona and Gil Ast in Tel Aviv have shown analyzing uh, chip data uh, from cells in which they iso the, 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 the papers they based, but we based on were papers where they isolated nucleosomes, mononucleosomes, and look at the sequences of the nucleosomes, uh, and then uh, Guigot and Gil Ast as whether those sequences were preferentially distributed uh, on exons or introns, and they really found that there is a positioning of nucleosomes on exons, a preferential positioning of nucleosomes on exons. And they analyzed whether this is uh, higher in constitutive exons compared to alternative exons, in weak sites compared to stronger sites, in pseudo exons that are in the middle of introns. There is another paper by Chris Birch publishing molecular cells, analyzing the same data and reaching to the same similar conclusions. So there is now this idea that nucleosomes are uh, preferentially positioned on exons, and that might have something to do with uh, chromatin and elongation and splicing. And since uh, Gigo is from Barcelona, and although Hagen is from Germany, uh, they are all very Catalan people, they chose a Catalan painter Juan Miró to, uh, do, to illustrate um, the cover of the paper in Nature, uh, Structural Molecular Biology. Of course, uh, this is a recreation in the Miró style of the idea. You see a nucleosome and the exon in white wrapping the nucleosome. Oh, it doesn't mean that there are not nucleosomes in introns, because an intron of 5,000 base pairs cannot be the void of nucleosomes. But they are positioned on exons, and then in the introns, one assumes that they are not positioned. They are, they, 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 their situation is variable. So this is the, the data they showed. They showed this is an average exon, and you see uh, nucleosome occupancy goes up at the beginning of the exon, goes up at the end of the exon, and this is the nucleosome occupancy along an intron. And this seems to be conserved because in C. elegans it was also observed. This is an average C. elegans exon. You, you see peaks of nucleosome positioning on the exons. And the biological meaning of these could be that perhaps, perhaps, <coughs> the concept of exon definition that was proposed by Susan Berger some decades ago uh, doesn't need necessarily to be considered only at the pre-mRNA level, meaning exon definition as crosstalk of proteins, factors that bind to the acceptor and the donor, and then the distance is critical because this crosstalk can be disrupted if the distance is longer. But also, at the co-transcriptional level, if a nucleosome is preferentially positioned on an exon, perhaps this controls in a way uh, kinetic coupling or recruitment coupling and allows the exon to be seen when it's transcribed uh, by the splicing machinery. A nice thing from the Chris Birch work 
is that he compared isolated exons towards clustered exons, meaning exons that are flanked by very, very long introns and exons that are flanked by short introns and clustered, okay? And he found that the isolated exons had a higher peak of nucleosome positioning compared to the clustered exons, which also makes sense because that might help for the splicing machinery to see something that has to be recognized <coughs> as an exon in a huge sea of introns. It's, it's a long, long sea of introns. How does the machinery, just by looking at the splicing size, is that enough? Is it sufficient? Well, conclusions. Uh, pole 2 elongation regulates alternative splicing. This is what we call kinetic coupling. UV radiation through DNA damage affects alternative splicing in a P53 independent manner via hyperphosphorylation of the CTD and inhibition of pole 2 elongation. And uh, we also show that SIRNAs targeting pre mRNA specific regions can create heter heterochromatin silence in marks that control alternative splicing through its kinetic coupling with pole 2 elongation. And we call this new mechanism TGSAS. And we thought that perhaps, perhaps it might be useful to correct alternative splicing errors in a sequence specific manner. And the fact that AO1 and Dyson depletions affect alternative splicing of many genes suggests that endogenous small RNAs, we don't know whether they are microRNAs or endogenous siRNAs, might participate in an endogenous TGSAS pathway. So I'd like to thank the people in my lab. Uh, Manuel Munoz did all the work with the UV light and alternate splicing. Mariano Alio did the work on the siRNAs on uh, chromatin structure and TGSAS. Ignacio Shore, I just showed one slide from, from his work, but work on the NCAM exon 18 inclusion and uh, the role of acetylation of histones, histone change and uh, chromatin and alternative splicing. And Ezequiel and Selena, Ezequiel works on plant alternative splicing on Arabidopsis, and we are studying, I didn't have time to tell him, tell you his data, but we are studying the effect of light, of uh, photosynthesis on signaling and alternative splicing. And Celine Lafay is working on this um, um, first come, first served, revisited, in which uh, we are looking at what happens with the rate of intron excision being the second intron excised first than the first one. Valeria is the senior technician in the lab, and uh, without her we would be dead. And these, these are undergraduate students, and these are people who are not in the lab anymore and contributed to the work I told you this morning. And these are collaborations, the current collaborations related to the, to the work I, I, I told you. David Bentley, uh, Eduardo Bertin, Juan Valcarcel, and these are the bioinformatic people from Eduardo Eiras' lab. And, and uh, with Benoit and Brosco, we did the panel of 96 alternative splicing events and the Dicer and, and uh, Ego 1 knockdown. And this is the funding, and thank you very much for the <laughs>